Hi, and welcome to Computer Science Theory. I'm Tim Randolph, uh, and this is comms W3261 at Columbia University, Summer B 2021. This is lecture zero. So today we're gonna be going over some of the discrete math fundamentals that are assumed prerequisites for this course. So we're gonna be going pretty fast. I will provide definitions for most things, but the idea is that you should recognize these things and feel more or less comfortable with them. One way to use this lecture would be to go through it fast at regular speed or double speed and flag everything that you're not super comfortable with. All the material we're gonna to cover today is in the textbook chapter zero. So that's Sipser, uh, intro to the theory of computation, third edition just in case you're watching this ahead of or outside the course and you haven't picked it up yet. And this is all chapter zero, mainly section 0 0.2. So the thing I am gonna focus on today is even if these are objects you may have seen or heard of before, you may not have thought about them in the way we're going to think about them in this class. In particular, this class is a very constructive building class. We're gonna take mathematical objects like sets and sequences and k-tuples and graphs that you may have heard of. And we're gonna combine them in interesting ways to create larger, more complicated, somewhat more artificial formal objects than you may have seen in math before. And that building process, much like when you program a computer, lets you create large formal objects with well-defined properties that, that you can then prove things about. So that's why these building blocks are super important. And it's why being able to think flexibly and comfortably about them is gonna really serve you well in this course. So that's our motivation. And hopefully today I can help you think about some of these objects in ways that you haven't thought about them before. Without further ado, the most basic building block that we'll use throughout this course is the set. And a set is just a bag of unique objects. So in particular, these objects can be numbers, but they can also be letters. They can be geometric objects like points or lines or planes or uh, shapes. They can be graphs. They can be more complicated mathematical objects like Turing machines. They can be defined explicitly by writing them all out or programmatically by specifying a rule and saying this set contains every object that satisfies this rule. So we'll move flexibly back and forth between those sorts of representations of sets. Typically when I write a finite set down, I'll use these little curly braces. So let's define a couple sets here. Here's a set A, it contains the objects one, two, three. Those objects are in curly braces, they're unique, they have no order. Uh, here's a set B, contains the letters, a, B, C. And if you want to relax this uniqueness requirement, you can create a thing called a multi-set. Multi-sets just don't have to have every object at most once. So for instance, the multi-set 112 has the item one with multiplicity two. Um, when we talk about sets, a convenient way to think about them sometimes, like I could imagine this set being everything contained in this circle, this set being everything contained in that circle. And, you know, we can draw Venn diagrams or things like that to visualize set properties. Um, we'll use a lot of set operators. So you should probably be familiar with these, but I'll review them really quick just in case. So this is the intersection operator, this little cap or upward cup. It indicates all of the elements that are in both A and B. The union operator, this downward cup, indicates all the objects that are in either A or B or both. Um, the slightly less common exclusive or operator, which you can make from these other ones if you want to, written like this, the little circle with the plus in it, also used for XOR in a similar way by analogy to Boolean logic. So this is gonna select all of the elements that are in A or in B, but not in both. Um, and then finally, the set difference operator, 
a, I'll write a slash or a minus b. So this indicates all of the objects that are in a, but not in b. Sometimes you'll see this used only when b is a proper subset of a. But in this case, we don't lose anything to say, OK, a minus b just means a minus all the elements in a that are also in b. Um, when we talk about sets, you'll see this little guy a lot, this little epsilon looking sideways e. It means in, included, is a member of. So if I'd write the statement a in b, that means that the letter a is an element of the set b. Similarly, I can write is not in a slash to the inclusion. And kind of analogous to this, I could write this little sideways C with a line under it to indicate that C is a subset of B. With the line allows the possibility of equality. So in this case, I've written C is a subset of B, or C is properly equal to B. And if I want to rule out the possibility that C is equal to B, I can just write the same operator without the line underneath it. So we have set inclusion, and we have the subset relation, as well as a bunch of operators on sets. Again, I'm not going to go too much into detail, but there's a great section of this in the Sipser book in section 0.2. So if these are not as familiar concepts to you, go check that out. Um, one other operator we'll use on sets, I'll write two vertical lines, which should remind you of magnitude with integers to indicate the size or cardinality of the set. So if we think about our set A, it's got three elements. The cardinality of A is three, or just the size of A is three. Uh, remember, sets can be infinite. So this number can be an infinity. It can even be an infinity that's larger or smaller than other infinities. But we'll come back to that when we talk about computability. So what if you want to add some order to your sets? You want something that works kind of like an array works when you're programming. In that case, you're going to want to use a sequence, which is just an ordered set. So for instance, I'll define the sequence C. Instead of the curly braces, I'll use parentheses. And I'll say the sequence C is the letters A, B, C. And this is just different from the set in the fact that B is the second element of the sequence. Um, and this is distinct from B, A, C. You could also have a sequence with the same element multiple times. Um, this kind of steps around whether or not this element is unique because these two elements are indexed. You could refer to the A in the first position of the sequence or the second position. And of course, uh, you could have an infinite sequence if you wanted to. So you could have 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, just integers doubling. And that could go on to infinity. If you have a finite sequence, we'll sometimes call it a k-tuple. where a k-tuple, k just refers to the number of items in the sequence. So it would be totally reasonable to say that c is a finite sequence. It is. You could also call it a three-tuple or a triple. Sometimes we'll call a two-tuple a pair or a three-tuple a triple. And I hope you find those terms relatively intuitive. Um, now that we have sets and sequences, I want to give you a very basic idea of how we can use these basic building blocks to start to build more and more complex operations and more and more complex objects. So often you want your operators to be very fundamental. You want to capture something about the world, but there's really no limit to what you can build. It's almost a little bit like programming, and you can make whatever mathematical objects you want. And the fact that you've defined them formally means you can prove things about them formally, and you can really deeply understand them. That's one of the cool things about formal science, and one of the nice things about computer science as a branch of mathematics. So for instance, I'm going to define this operator. And it's called the Cartesian product. And it's defined on sets. How it works is I've got the set 
suppose I've got the set AB and I take the Cartesian product by one, two. The output is just a set of all the tuples you can make by taking an element of the first set and an element of the second set. So A1 is one such pair, A2 is a second such pair, uh, B1 and B2 are the last two pairs. So you can also do this with infinite sets. And this is just a way of saying, like for instance, sometimes you might see two dimensional um, integer space written as Z squared or Z cross Z. And this is literally just the Cartesian product of the integers twice. Um, this is the set of every pair of integers. So another way to think about sets in the real plane. Uh, you can also think about, I mean, you can think about any, almost any algebraic object, probably any algebraic object in terms of sets or maybe tuples. You can also build graphs out of sets and tuples. And you've probably seen this before in discrete math. So graphs are mathematical objects that capture relationships. So typically one way graphs are commonly represented a bunch of objects, vertices, nodes, these little dots, and lines representing each pair of objects that bear some relationship to each other. So this is a perfectly reasonable graph. And this is a perfectly reasonable way to represent a graph. But commonly, you'll see a graph G written as a tuple containing a set of vertices. and a set of edges. So this is a set of vertices. This is a set of edges. If I quickly label my vertices, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, then for this particular graph, V is the set A through G, and E is a set of tuples containing all the pairs of elements that share an edge. So AB would be in this set, BC would be in this set, CF would be in this set, and this would go on until I had included all of the edges in my graph. So you might wonder, well, okay, this picture is pretty compact and it tells me everything I need to know about the graph. Why would I ever wanna write it out in terms of vertices and in terms of edges. Why would I ever want to take that much time? And usually the only reasons you would do that is if you wanted to prove something formally. So now you've got a set of vertices and edges to work with and to talk about and to refer to. Or if you had an infinite or a very large graph based on a certain particular property, you might say, I want to specify the vertex set or the edge set using some well-defined procedure in which case it actually might be more concise and easier to think about if you write down the vertex set or the edge set. So these are among the things you can think about when you're doing problems in this class or writing up the homework set. Um, when I'm talking about a graph, what representation gives me the most insight? How can I write down what I'm working with to be precise and clear while being efficient? Let's see, there's a few notions about graphs, a few common concepts that you've probably seen in discrete math, but I'm gonna write them down here. If you're not familiar, they're all fully defined in the textbook. So the degree of a vertex V is just the number of incident edges. So for instance, the degree of the node E in the graph up at the top is three, it's connected to D, G, and F. Um, a subgraph is a graph where, um, well, let's define a new graph H, which is V2, E2, has some vertex set and some edge set. And we say H is a subgraph of G if V2 is a proper subset of V or any subset of V. 
and E2 is a subset of E. So I can always draw a subgraph on top of my original graph. Like I might have a subgraph that contains E, G, and F, and just the edges E, G, and G, F. That would be a proper subgraph. But if it also contained B and the edge B, F, that would not be a subgraph because BF is not in the original graph. Um, a path is just a sequence of vertices that are connected by edges. So for instance, I suppose if we have all of these edges in our graph, uh, E, G, F, C, A is a path. I'll draw it out. E, G, F, C. Oh, that's not even a path in our graph, is it? Well, whoops. Let's just fix that example. E, G, F, C, B, A is a proper path. We've also got a cycle. That's a path that ends where it starts. So any set of vertices and edges that ends where it starts, I would write down this path by writing all the vertices and writing the start vertex twice, this cycle. Um, a tree is a connected graph with no cycles. So often you'll see trees drawn like this, hanging down from some root node R. But note that any graph that has this property of being fully connected with no cycles can be drawn this way with an arbitrary root. So a tree may not always look immediately like this. But the definition is just a connected graph with no cycles. And I suppose I should um, clarify in case this is not a term that you're familiar with. A connected graph is a graph that is all in one piece where every node is reachable from every other node. So this graph is connected, um, but if I then erase the edge connecting this last node, this graph is now unconnected because you can draw a line in between the different parts. And then finally, you can have a directed graph or digraph. And those of you who are really paying attention might have noticed, hey, when I defined edge set, I defined it as tuples, which are ordered rather than little sets. And that's because sometimes we want to define a graph as a digraph. In this case, if I have a digraph with two vertices A and B, the edge AB, that's this edge, is different from the edge BA which is the edge backwards. And indeed, you can have both of those at the same time in a digraph. So that's our review of graphs. The next discrete objects we're going to talk about, and these may actually be less familiar to you because they don't always come up in an introductory discrete math class. So I'll go a little bit slower as we introduce them, are strings and languages. So to define these, they're very similar to the strings you've worked with if you've programmed before. We'll start with an alphabet. So let's say an alphabet is a set of characters, also called symbols. Often when we write down an alphabet, we'll use sigma as the notion for this set. So we could have sigma equals 0, 1. That's the binary alphabet. It has two letters, zero and one. You could also have sigma equal to A, B, C, dot, dot, dot through Z. That's the Roman alphabet. You can add other fun vowels and consonants as you see fit. But the Roman alphabet is usually what we use to write English language words. Um, and there's no limit to what symbols you can put in an alphabet. And then a string is just a finite and this bit's important, um, sequence of symbols. 
For instance, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0 is a string on the binary alphabet. My name, Tim, well, maybe with a lowercase t as I've defined it, is a string in the Roman alphabet. Um, and then finally, a language is a set of strings. So you can relate this back to kind of an intuitive definition, a linguistic definition of a language by thinking, okay, well, we've got our alphabet of A through Z. We have our strings, our finite, all finite sequences of the letters A through Z. And maybe we define, you know, we'll call the language English. And we'll define it as the set of all words W such that W is, well, I can't really use the set inclusion symbol that can I because it's not well defined. All words W such that W is in the English language. But more commonly, the way we're going to use languages in this course is to talk about them as mathematical objects, groups of strings that when interpreted in some way have a related meaning. So we might define a language L and say this language L contains all strings W in 0, 1 to the N. This notation just means um, they have some length N such that W is a palindrome. So maybe n is three and our palindromes are zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, one, et cetera. This has a slightly mathematical meaning. It has an even more mathematical meaning if we define languages like all strings that represent primes using the binary alphabet. So we're gonna be using languages a lot and we're gonna be using languages to capture concepts. So primeness is a great example. If we have a language of all strings, all binary strings that represent primes, we can ask questions about the structure of that language. How hard is it to figure out if a string is in the language is equivalent to asking, how hard is it to figure out whether or not that string is a prime? Um, asking, is some number, like if we consider the, the language of all natural numbers that are squares and the sum of two squares, that's similar to asking the question, um, can we identify all of the right triangle triples perhaps, which obey the Pythagorean theorem? So you can start to see how we're gonna use languages in the future to ask questions about math. And we're in fact gonna be building machines out of math to recognize languages. That's one of the first few lectures in this course. Very quickly, I'm gonna mention Boolean logic. So this is logic with true or T or one, the most common way we'll write it in this course and false or F or zero. And you should be familiar with basic operators on these numbers. So um, we've got and, or, not, implies. And you should be able to tell me, you know, what is one and one? Well, the and operator is only true if both are true. So this case, this is true. Um, you should probably add XOR to this list exclusive or. So one exclusive or zero, exactly one of the arguments is one. So the output is one. One exclusive or one is zero. Uh, I'm not gonna write out the truth tables for all of these, but they're in the book and they should be relatively intuitive. If you haven't seen these before, the place of comfort you wanna get to is to the point where I could write out any operation like one or zero or one implies one, and you could boil this down and figure out whether or not it's true or false. Um, 
I'm also, the book covers in chapter one functions, sorry, chapter zero. So in this case, we're thinking about mostly discrete functions that go from some domain D to some range R. Usually we'll think of the domain as a set, maybe infinite. The range is a set, maybe infinite. And objects in one map to the other. In this course, we won't be limited to thinking about um, injective or surjective functions. So often we'll think about functions where two objects map to the same thing or um, the same thing sometimes even maps to multiple objects. Sometimes we'll define functions on pairs. So you might take in a pair of inputs and map them to an output. And these may not be familiar mathematical notions, but I bet they're familiar programming notions. If you've ever written a function that takes multiple arguments, you're writing a function that at some level um, maps two objects to one object, the input of your function to the output. Um, another topic we're just gonna go blitz right through is that of proofs. So proofs are gonna be very important for this course. Most of the problem sets are going to be problems of the form, here's a statement. Um, I want you to write formal proofs for those statements. The goal of every proof is that it should be rigorously reducible to something that's completely concrete, but often you don't have to go completely down to the point of elementary concreteness. Um, I'd really prefer if you err on the side of being as explicit as possible when you write your proofs. So a good way to think about it is imagine your TA reading this. You want your TA to do as little work as possible. If they have to do a lot of work to read your proofs, even if they may be correct, uh, they'll have permission to dock some points. So when writing, it's a really good skill to be able to think about how can I write this in such a way that anyone, a TA, someone with the basic mathematical knowledge could formally reconstruct every step that I'm doing. Types of proofs that you'll probably want to be familiar with in more detail in the book include construction. And we'll use this whenever there's a statement of the fact of the type, prove that some A exists. Well, you want to write it down a procedure for generating that A and explain why it can be a real thing. Uh, contradiction. One way to prove that some statement A implies another statement B is to assume that A is true and B is false and show that that leads to some impossible contradiction. That means that your initial assumption of A must be false. In other words, if A is true, then B has to be true. Induction is gonna be pretty important as well. So this is a way to prove a statement about some infinite class of things, like all the natural numbers, for instance. Induction works by first proving a base case and then saying, hey, if it's true for this case, this smaller case, it must be true for the bigger case. That's called the inductive step. And by putting those two arguments together, it's true for the baseline case. And if it's true for a small step, it must be true for a bigger step. You can then just imply your inductive step an infinite number of times to generate a proof that holds for an entire set, possibly an infinite set. So that's all the topics for lecture zero for now. Um, so we're gonna wrap up this lecture there. I'm looking forward to seeing you in class and I really hope you enjoy the course. If there are things that are still unclear after watching this lecture, going through the book, um, I invite you to tell me about them. We can talk about them in class. So thank you very much for watching. Have a great day. Bye.